Okay, so my weekly guest for today is absolutely amazing. My friend Catherine Terrell from, from Costa Rica actually described to my guest as a whip smart scientist, poised, super talented artist, and amazing water woman. I couldn't have said it better myself, Catherine, so I actually decided to use your description of Jesse as I kick off the podcast. I first met Jesse Kendall Barr a few years ago at a water woman's event, actually that Catherine put on and Jessie was shooting some really fun surf photography because she has all the cool water housing. You know how you meet someone and you know them initially for one thing, like, okay, badass babe who does surf photography, but then you start to peel back the layers of the onion and you're like, whoa, this chick is so complex and cool and has so much more to her, right? Jessie is in her PhD program at UC Santa Cruz in the ecology and evolutionary biology department studying the neurophysiology and sleep of marine mammals. I can barely even pronounce all that. She's amazing. She's also a published author and illustrator. And as a water woman, her sport of choice is diving, both free diving and scuba. And Jessie loves a good kelp forest. You are about to hear some of her stories and she actually does her best to take you on your own underwater journey on this podcast. Lastly, what I love about Jessie is she has found a way to communicate science, so results, data, graphs, through art and illustration. Now, I wish that 20 years ago when I wanted to be an astronaut and my science teacher told me I should find another career because I was getting C's in science, that I had someone like Jessie to help communicate in a way that I could understand. So she's just paving the way. Lastly, if you want to support the podcast, please hop over to iTunes leave a review for the Salted Spirit podcast, or even easier than that, just give a quick share about the podcast on your Instagram story and be sure to tag me so I can repost. All right, friends, that's my intro for today. Let's go ahead and welcome Jesse to the show. It's kind of a rainy day in LA and uh, I'm just happy to be here. So we might hear some kids screaming, squealing. <laughs> and some grunts from the tennis players. Yes, we're actually yep, right by the tennis courts as well. If anyone's uh, brave enough to get out during the, the clouds, it's not even really raining. But yeah, so we might have some interesting, fun background noise. It's always like s fun with the van because you just never know what you're going to pick up. But thank you for joining me today. What do you have here? Got a nice little visual for us right yeah. off the bat. So this is actually my newest children's book um, that I illustrated. It was part of an art science residency with uh, the Norris Center for Natural History. And it was a project with uh, the author Paloma Medina and um, Audrey Ford, um, where we were illustrating the story of Finding Nemo's father, who should have transitioned to Finding Nemo's mother. Oh. Um, so it retells the story of Finding Nemo from a queer biological lens. Wow, awesome. And it introduces some of the less known models of parenthood in the animal kingdom. Wow. Um, like these male uh, seahorses and jawfish that actually do most of the parental care in their reproductive system. Cool. Yeah. And you're learning all about this through your PhD, I'm sure, and mm -hmm. just the hands-on diving that you're doing. Yeah. Okay, definitely. cool. Well, congrats on the book and being an author you. at such a young <laughs> age. That's incredible. And it's a beautiful illustration. So you did all the illustrations? I did the illustrations, yeah. The other two wrote it. Awesome. Good collaboration. Yeah. Congrats, <laughs> Jesse. Thank you. I was thinking uh, it'd be cool to start the podcast off just because you're a diver and you're so connected to the ocean. That's what kind of water woman you are. I mean, you do a lot of things in the water, but maybe for people who have never been diving in their life, never been in the ocean or underwater, if you could think of a time or describe a scenario for us when you went diving and maybe you were surprised by, you know, some sensory thing like something you saw or heard or felt and just kind of describe what it's like to be a diver and be underwater in this like amazing world. So I think what's the most striking thing about especially free diving is when you go underwater there's no more noise, like there's no more of this buzz that you always get on on land. And with that sensory deprivation, kind of you're more attuned to the sort of crackles of the reef. It's almost a, an asmr -y feeling for me. Yeah. <laughs> it makes me feel very relaxed and calm. You know, there's this mammalian dive reflex that slows down our heart beat mm. when we go in the water and we when we go underwater. If you can manage to relax. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you're actually, your body helps you 
relax and um, lowers your heart rate. And that's actually what I study in my science too. So I guess, yeah, when I go diving, I love that, that silence that first kicks in mm. and then you dive down and I love to dive in the kelp forest. So an amazing part about the kelp forest is when the kelp fronds get really close to one another, then they act kind of like a prism huh. and they separate the white light from the sun yeah. into these rainbows Aww. that sort of dance on the floor. Yeah. And I remember the second dive, so the first dive I did was pretty miserable. That was like a scuba dive, um, my certification dive. Why was it miserable? I was way too cold yeah. and I had, um, I was really intent on getting some good photos. Uh. So I tie my GoPro Hero 2 around my wrist <laughs> and it cut off the circulation in my hand and my hand swole up like a tennis ball. Oh <laughs> like my gosh. Super big. Yeah. And very uncomfortable. I was very cold. Yeah. I was like, I don't like this diving <laughs> stuff. It was like green. I couldn't see anything. Where were you? I was in Monterey. Okay. So okay. like 48 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh yeah. Water. That's cold. That's cold. <laughs> yeah. Pretty cold. But then my second dive, I decided to give it another go. And I remember seeing these rainbows just dancing on the mm. bottom of the kelp forest floor. And there was this little sea fan that got lit up by a rainbow and then the school of fish just came mm -hmm. out around it and and then in the distance I saw harbor seal and I was like oh my goodness <laughs> just all my favorite things in Aww. one place that's amazing um, and and I what I really love about the kelp forest is that it's this 3d structure mm. um that's very interesting at any altitude kind of hmm. so like if you go very low to the floor you can see lots of little colorful nudibranchs you see slugs they're moving very slowly and you're really lucky if you can spot them and then a little bit higher you see these huge huge schools of rockfish and then near the surface that's where you can find lots of little crabs and things living on the surface of the kelp hmm. Hmm. if you look carefully yeah. like once i found a whole orgy of sea slugs wow. um, there was hundreds of them <laughs> mating wow um, just hidden within the fronds of the kelp cool yeah do you ever get nervous in the kelp forest because they're so dense and it can be dark and it's like you don't know what's looking <laughs> around the corner I mean yeah definitely I think so there's like this this balance right of like feeling comfortable yeah and you're also stepping outside your comfort zone to mm. some extent Generally, I feel safer in the kelp, hmm. um, but have had some experiences where I was about to dive and actually ended up diving and I got out of the water and um, everyone told me, like, oh, did you see the great white shark that Ooh! was swimming above you? <laughs> above you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you just... I didn't see it. <laughs> why did you get out? It was just the end of my dive, so I had oh spent, you know, an hour and a half underwater wow. at that very location. And I think it's 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 a risk that we take definitely. Yeah. But it's it's just so uncommon and yeah. And the sharks, you know, they're there, especially yeah. in Northern California. Like yeah. it's they're definitely swimming around. Yeah. <laughs> but it's very rare that they would yeah. actually target, especially a diver. I don't think there's any recorded attack of a diver. Um, maybe some like investigations of kayaks mm. and stuff. But, mm. Yeah. Um, so you've been swimming with great whites before and seen them in the water? No, I haven't seen oh, them in the water. Okay. No, that was why I was like, oh my goodness, you saw one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, there's definitely some moments where, you know, you're looking into the murk and you can kind of get this, like, this, it feels, uh, we call it, I, I felt a little sharky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you just, like, kind of feel this, like, sense of yeah darkness closing in a little, especially at the edge of the kelp forest, like, where I go free diving in Big Sur. Um, there's these big bull kelp forests that are really spectacular, but it, they're usually found in a little deeper water. And then you get like to the edge of that, and you just look out at this like deep blue. And and I've just heard my friends' stories of seeing them kind of just like just barely yeah. in your line of sight. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, people have seen them yeah. in Monterey um, yeah. a lot recently. Yeah. Um, but. I don't know. It doesn't keep me out. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. So when you go diving and you're going really deep, do you actually have a tank with you or are you literally free diving and coming up for air, like holding your breath and coming so up? So I do both. I scuba dive and I free dive. Yeah. Um, I usually prefer free diving. It's just less gear and, mm -hmm. again, that silence that yeah. I really like. It's only possible when you're not mm. blowing bubbles every five seconds. Yeah. 
and I, I just find it really meditative. Mm. But I also really love taking pictures, and it's challenging to take pictures while freediving. Mm. I still try to, um, but it takes a lot of air just to get yourself in a buoyant housing mm. down to the bottom, and then you have to set up your strobes and set up your shot. And, you know, I'm, I'm more interested in just documenting the things that I see so mm-hmm. that I can share them with my friends. But other people, and my friend Marco Maza is like this incredible freediving photographer and oh. sets up these macro shots oh. like of tiny, tiny nudibranchs um, on breath hold. Um, so, you know, I aspire to be like him, but I'm also, oh. I don't think I'm that patient. Uh, so I just want to get the picture of the thing so that it's identifiable. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then go up for air. How long can you hold your breath, Jesse? I'm I'm not very impressive <laughs> because it only takes, you yeah. know, like 20 seconds to go down to the bottom. Yeah. Then you have another 20 seconds to set up your shot and then 20 seconds to go back up. Yeah. So I, I don't normally hold my breath for more than a minute and yeah. 15, 30 seconds. Maybe if I really tried yeah. and I wasn't moving that much, yeah. I could maybe do longer than that. Yeah. But well, when you're taking shots and doing other things, too, you're expending more energy. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I'm always amazed at anyone can, that can hold their breath at all. I mean, <laughs> as a surfer, it's not I'm, I don't have to hold my breath for very long, typically, because I'm not in huge surf. But it's yeah. something I'm trying to work towards. And it's a goal. So that's mm-hmm. why even like having confidence with a minute or two minutes, um, I you know, it changes the game mentally for you when you're underwater, no matter yeah. what you're doing. So yeah, it's all surfer, impressive. It's, it's so challenging because you have to time your breath. You know, you don't want to hold your breath too long because yeah. then you're going to come up when the next wave of yeah. the set is crashing on you. Exactly. <laughs> so you have to time it right and yeah. hold your breath long enough to get under. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Amazing. So I just want to back up a little bit and thank you for describing just some of those feelings and sights and amazing things that you get to see underwater. It's pretty cool. To the opposite end of the spectrum, can you remember your earliest memory of water? Yeah, so... Well, I don't know if it's my earliest memory of water because uh, my my family is always, we, we're very fortunate. We've been able to travel yeah. a lot and, and go to the beach a lot. Um, so I, I definitely can't remember the first time I saw it or touched it. Um, yeah. But I, I do remember those sort of formative experiences with the ocean and yeah. um, gaining familiarity with it. Actually, when I was growing up in Palo Alto, we had a cabin in Santa Cruz. Okay. And that's sort of where I learned to surf um, at Cowles and they, oh. with my family. I just grew fascinated with water. And then I also did a, a summer camp hmm. um, called Ocean Explorers. And that was at the university where I'm studying now hmm. um, at UC Santa Cruz. I actually met the dolphin that I got to work with as a PhD student hmm. when I was 12 years old. Was that Primo? Yeah, Primo. I was just reading your story about yeah. that. I'd love for you to tell us about that too. How do you think Primo inspired you and impacted your love for the ocean and everything you've done from that point on? Yeah, so I mean, I think it's it's one thing to see a marine mammal while you're out on the ocean. Mm-hmm. And, and that's great if you're able to go on a boat and if you don't get seasick and all these things yeah. come together so that you're able to have that experience in the wild. And they're also, you know, there's a chance that you might not see them when you go whale watching or something. Yeah. Um, so to bring that experience to all of these young kids that are deciding in the direction of their future, mm. I mean, it definitely had an impact on me. Yeah. It's not just a charismatic megafauna, but it's also this incredibly intelligent animal that's trained to to answer questions with us about re- about their bodies, about their physiology. And I think that's that was really exciting to see the interaction between the researchers and the trainers and the animals. Mm-hmm. What well, can you tell me more about that? I was reading your post about heart rate and just heart activity underwater. What mm-hmm. were they studying with Primo? Yeah, so with Primo, Primo, I believe, was the first ever cetacean to have his heartbeat mm. recorded underwater. Mm which is a really big deal yeah. um, because you're recording electricity in this medium, salt water, that's super conductive. Yeah. Um, and it's really tricky to do that. Um, I'm actually now, for my research, yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to pick up even smaller signals, the signals that are generated by our brain hmm. um, while we sleep. 
And for that to work, you need really sensitive electrodes um, and the ability to pick up things on the surface because we don't want to harm the animals in any way. So we're just putting things um, on the surface of their skin, just like we would do in a human sleep study. Hmm. Um, so it's really challenging to get that um, the technology developed. Mm. So they basically made a heart rate monitor for Primo. And that was a huge step forward. We actually just, there was a paper that came out this week where they put the same heart rate mon monitor that was, you know, first built and developed by these different uh, groups. I mean, all, the marine mammal yeah. <laughs> field is huge. And there are a lot of people responsible for these discoveries. But yeah, they just put um, a heart rate monitor on a blue whale. Wow. Um, so it's just amazing what we're getting to learn about the, the limits of the mammalian body. Yeah. Um, the largest heart ever to beat. <laughs> yeah. And what its physiological maximum is and minimum, too. Yeah. So, and I think maybe not everyone knows we're mammals and we we're designed to be in water, right? Mm -hmm. So when our, when we dive or we're in the water, in the ocean or in lakes or pools or whatever, our bodies have a natural reaction to being mm -hmm. in the water. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so basically our dive reflex um, lowers our heart rate and it redirects all the blood from our extremities and puts it to the vital organs like the heart and the lungs, um, the heart and the brain mostly. Mm -hmm. um, that reflex allows you to dive for longer and it's a little bit less developed in humans, but for these diving mammals, like the elephant seals that I work on, mm. um, they're built for deep diving. Mm. So their their heart rate, um, I was just like, <laughs> I stayed up till 2 a.m. last <laughs> night because I was so excited about my data. Um, <laughs> I love the, it. The data biggest, nerd. <laughs> the biggest signal that we get um, when we record these signals from elephant seals is their heart rate. Mm. Um, and it's just amazing to watch just as soon as it starts holding its breath, it, it basically halves. Mm. So from 90 to 50, mm. at least in the case of this um, juvenile um, that I was studying, that change happens instantly. Mm. And as soon as they stop, stop breathing, um, their heart rate drops down so that they can stay at that depth for longer. Wow. And so you're in your PhD program at, in Santa Cruz currently. Yeah. And what are you studying there? My research, um, I'm looking at the sleep patterns mm -hmm. of um, marine mammals mm -hmm. and specifically interested in developing non-invasive ways. So um, basically the definition of invasive is something that pierces the skin or not. Mm -hmm. um, so all the previous studies on sleep, like I'm sure you know that a dolphin only sleeps with half of its brain. Mm. And that's like this this really fascinating um, discovery that's led us to ask all these questions that um, teach us about human sleep. But the way that they found that out was they had to do these va invasive mm. su surgical procedures. So I'm trying to make what we do with humans work on seals so that we can get those brain records and brain activity measurements from an animal that's unharmed, basically. In a non-invasive way. Yeah. Where are you at with your science and research right now with that? Um, so as I'm going to qualify soon, mm -hmm. um, which means that I'll advance to candidacy. Um, so I'm in my third year of my PhD program, and I'll probably have about three more years yet. Wow. But I just recorded this sort of pre preliminary data mm -hmm. um, cool. where I was testing this. It's basically like like a human sleep study. <laughs> yeah. And it goes on the head of the animal, and the animal can swim around and mm. behave totally normally. Um, and then when we're done, we just release the animal back into the wild. Okay. Um, so that's just for testing, and then eventually when we tested enough. I think even next year we're going to be deploying this uh, instrument on wild animals cool. um, to see their behavior in the wild. Because again, we know about marine mammal sleep, but since we've been using these like other methods, mostly on animals in captivity, we have no idea. It You know, you go on a whale watching boat and somebody says that dolphin is sleeping. We have no idea that we have no evidence that mm. dolphins even sleep in the wild. Hmm. Um, so we don't have those recordings yet, hmm. um, and this device might allow us to make those recordings. Cool. You're going to listen back on this podcast in a <laughs> couple of years and be like, oh, man, I've done so much since then. Like That's the, that's the hope. That's the yeah. goal. That's the goal. With the rate mm -hmm. you're going, I imagine you will get there. I think it's really beautiful just the time I've spent with you. I've had the opportunity to go surfing with you and have you take 
beautiful surf photography of me (laughs) and it's been such a treat to be in the water with you and see that creative side of you and then hear like how incredibly intelligent you are and how you're studying science and you're in a PhD and you're doing all these things um, and you're an illustrator like you have this beautiful mix of creative imagination and science and I, I just think it's unique and you bring a unique perspective because of that. Um, and your art is really important too. And that's one of the first things that drew me to you because I saw all of your beautiful illustrations and your underwater photography. Where did that stem from? All of your creative artwork and imagination and illustration. I mean, a lot of people have said this, the, the, the foundation of both art and science is the same thing. It's obser- observation. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's people who are patient enough to sit down and mm-hmm. and pose questions about the natural world and then record what they observe and that those recordings can be numbers um they can be notes um but in my case i i find that i learn really well visually for example like yesterday i was trying to interpret all this data that i have i have all these numbers mm. <laughs> and a lot of the numbers translate to meaningful things about the the environment and the only way i can really understand and and see whether or not i have the right data is for me to visualize it so i was working with my brother on creating an animation where basically the seal like rotates in space to demonstrate what the accelerometer is saying so you have an accelerometer in your phone um, that tells you when your phone's upside down so basically i was uh, translating all of those numbers into physical coordinates for the for the animal so that I could quickly see, okay, at this time point, what does the animal look like? Wow. <laughs> Instead of looking at all these numbers and trying to figure out how much acceleration on the x-axis and y-axis and z-axis, I could just see a picture of an elephant seal upside down. And I'm like, okay, this elephant is sleeping on its back. Yeah. Elephant seal. Jess, that's amazing. <laughs> That is really unique and so, so cool. I feel like, well, I am not a numbers person. I'll be the first (laughs) one to admit that uh, and disclose that. So also very much a visual learner. And I feel like if I had that way of learning, I would have grasped science probably much better and math and numbers because um, I tend to lead just towards the arts and not as strong in science. So that's a really cool thing and a cool way to teach not yeah. only kids, but adults and everybody. Yeah. Everybody. So I'm, as, a, as a scientist and a PhD student, you're also, you know, tasked with learning how to become a good teacher. Yeah. Um, and I think for me, like, that's, that's almost entirely how to explain science in a way that's comprehensible, but in, yeah. the, in the least time possible. So I find that diagrams can be really helpful for visual learners. That works. Yeah. For other learners, maybe they'll have to learn by sound or or touch um so when i when i try to teach these concepts i try to bring in different senses whatever appeals to the student yeah um and bring in a hold fast so that people can look through it and find what they find and Mm -hmm. ask questions and and feel and smell and (laughs) yeah i also do a lot of animation to explain concepts like Um, I did one with my brother um, about the ocean's biological carbon pump, which is basically how the ocean absorbs our carbon dioxide emissions Mm. um, and translates that into sinking snow that uh, goes to the deep ocean where it remains for thousands of years. So that process is really mitigating the problem of carbon dioxide emissions. Um, And we rely on it so heavily, but I feel like we don't really know that much about it. You hear a lot more about, you know the rainforest that's the lungs of the earth or whatever but this oceanic process is also really really important Mm -hmm. yeah and I think getting more people to understand the complexity of that whether it's through illustration and artwork um, can be very effective especially when we need we're in a time of change and needing Mm -hmm. to do things better and leverage resources that we have while we have them and try to maintain them and keep them healthy so they can keep us healthy Totally, (laughs) and you know we can still continue to thrive Um, I think it's just like out of sight out of mind and people don't see the the day-to-day effects of how things are really changing Mm -hmm. you know so very cool Um, I feel like you're going to change a lot of things and a lot of perspectives (laughs) and whether you realize it or not bring a lot of inspiration and hopefully behavior change to things and ideas and people and we all need that so thank you yeah 
a couple of months ago, I think I went to one of your art shows in Venice and I had the privilege of catching you for a minute because you were you were pretty popular that night and you were a busy woman. <laughs> but um, you had this it was this massive wood carving of this underwater world that you had <laughs> created and you went through this the whole thing of all of your ideas and I just stood there with my jaw on the floor <laughs> like how does someone even think this up? Like I think I'm a pretty creative person and I was totally blown away. <laughs> so can you give us like try to paint a visual for the people listening to this podcast and give like a a quicker version of that of like what your underwater world was (laughs) and just how to get there and what you do once you're under there and I'll also include some photos in the in the show notes too. So my mom's an architect um, and I'm trying to give her ideas for my future house. I think that one was a little bit out out of my budget. (laughs) (laughs) So it kind of ties into my career aspirations I think a little bit. I'm how to share the ocean with people. So that design was basically this like underwater glass house that allows you to interact with uh, abiotic and biotic features of the ocean environment. So the waves and the color of the water, but also actually seeing animals um, circulate around you. And I think uh, in in the future, I would Mm -hmm. love to help design aquaria and sort of do the same type of thinking about, you know, this is where the the kids' playroom can be and we just have cushions everywhere and Mm. then little um, peepholes at different ecosystems and you can see how each marine ecosystem is different. Anyway, so so my house was sort of this very fantastical (laughs) (laughs) version of uh, where I'd like to live that would allow me to, to... keep doing science so having little experiments uh, sediment yeah. plates also just observe schools of fish uh, moving around my bedroom <laughs> or something yeah. like that and um, how did you get into the house wasn't there a tree house aspect that was yeah. like the start so the like launch pad above land portion okay you ride your bike in and you can either ki- uh, get on the slide with your <laughs> kayak and just <laughs> plop into the ocean um, or you can take an elevator down to this um, subterranean level that's underwater and then that leads out to a room that you can put on your scuba tank and there's a pressurized chamber I don't really know how those work um, I'm not you would sure figure it's it out actually sound so don't try that at home um, but you can get out there um, check on your settlement plates and all of your experiments that are going on um, you can go surfing if you want that's also where the surfboards are stored awesome you um, thought of everything all um, underwater. All underwater, yeah. So cool. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was incredible. I've never seen anything like it. And I'm just impressed you even have this level of imagination. <laughs> so I have a feeling you'll make something happen in some capacity. Yeah. Maybe one day. like a waterfall. Or yeah. Like a staircase. Or yeah. <laughs> I like the bike part where you like cruise out on mm-hmm. your bike and it starts off as like a treehouse. Anyway, yeah. it was really incredible. So with that, because that's like the first time I've seen any of that in person, and now you're hosting classes, right, where you're doing wood carving Mm -hmm. or firing. Can you talk a little bit about that process and like how you've been doing those classes? Yeah, so I've been running some uh, workshops to teach people how to wood burn, which is basically a technique where you use a soldering iron, um, so the same tool that you would use to electrically connect wires and actually do some of that too. But for art, you basically just run it along the surface of wood and it burns it. Um, It requires a lot of patience, (laughs) Yeah, which I think is most people's uh, frustration with it Mm because you have to be really slow and deliberate if you want to get the nuanced uh, shading right so I do some workshops with with that and then um, I'm also running a workshop in January for um, scientists so that they can learn how to draw their study organism and in a way that allows them to start communicating their data with it Mm. and so I think those workshops where you empower people because everybody can draw I think it's not really Mm. it's not a skill that some people are born with and some people aren't it's just whether or not you're willing to sit down and and be observant and you know it it could just be tracing over your organism I think that teaches you so much to Mm. to to notice that there's this little nubbin here or whatever you know that could teach you about the animal and how it works um, or whatever system you're interested in cool um, is this part of your PhD program where you you are encouraged to host, you know, some kind of classes, or is this just some idea you had on your own? Where like I'm going to teach people to do wood burning because I enjoy <laughs> it and it's cool. 
Um, it's a little bit of both. Yeah. I think so. My advisors and my department are really, really supportive mm. um, of my efforts to combine art and science. I wouldn't say that it's uh, that they hold equal weight in my life at all times, um, but I try to do a mixture of both at all uh, at all times. So I'm mm. doing either art or science intensively for about two to three weeks and then I get a little tired and I mm -hmm. switch over but yeah my my advisor one of them is an illustrator and one of them is a photographer so they're both really supportive and and think it's great and mm. they've they've come out to some of my art shows which is really awesome because they're super busy people so to even yeah. get them in the same room yeah is a big deal um so it means a lot to me to have their support yeah so what so with all of your science and research and PhD where do you see yourself in five or ten years like what's the ultimate dream mm -hmm. to bring to fruition after all of this work you're doing like I said I think the idea of designing aquaria uh -huh. or something like working with a small aquarium to design art shows but also continue the research I'm doing mm -hmm. I think that would be really cool to um to work with science communication, but also um, continuing the research on marine mammals. I think there's so many great artists around the world that I've met, yeah. um, and more that still that I haven't met, and I would love mm. to be able to feature their artwork and their stories mm. and their science in sort of a curated way. Yeah. Um, so to do that at sort of a, a smallish aquarium or something, and cool. also be teaching and um, doing research on the side. Yeah. So I guarantee there'll be some women listening and maybe a lot of times even children or kids or adolescents that listen and get super inspired and they're going to be inspired by you and they're going <laughs> to think, I want to do science or study mammals or go to get my PhD like Jesse is. Mm -hmm. if, if you could go diving right now, no financial restrictions or travel <laughs> restrictions or school restrictions anywhere in the world to any kelp forest or see any animals or mammals, where would you want to dive? That's tricky. I'll give you two answers. Okay. <laughs> Two's good. <laughs> um, you know, I, I love I love to travel and and I'd I'd say like the place that I'm looking forward to diving the most anywhere in the world is probably Antarctica. Mm. Um, just because it's so unique and so crazy. <laughs> There's yeah. like huge invertebrates um on the bottom of the sea. But my other answer is that, you know, I I would love to just dive in the kelp forest here. I think it's mm -hmm. it's probably my favorite place on earth, at least so far. And there's something special about revisiting uh, the same dive site um, over time. You learn so much about how resilient a kelp forest can be and yeah. how much um, change there can there can be over a short period of time. And there are these really striking seasonal changes in the kelp forest in Monterey, mm -hmm. where in the summer like really hard to see anything because there's so much sun huh. and nutrient input that creates these huge blooms and you can't really see anything so it's actually almost people say it's the worst time to dive because yeah. you can't see anything and then by the time fall winter rolls around then the water really clears up mm. and the visibility can be sometimes as good as tropical places it's like 100 feet wow. of just kelp forests and wow. super beautiful. Does, do they change colors like the leaves do outside? Uh, no, they don't necessarily change color. Yeah. yeah. But the the whole ecosystem just like changes yeah. slowly over time. And then mm. there can be these really dramatic changes when a storm rolls through where yeah. um, it can pull up all the kelp really yeah. quickly um, or... What's been happening recently is these urchins I was gonna come ask out you about of that. the depths. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's a complicated food web. Yeah. But essentially what happens is if sea otters or other animals aren't eating enough sea urchins, the sea urchin populations can grow really big. And because the populations are so big, there's not enough kelp to feed these urchins. Um, so they have to kind of come out of their cracks and crevices and and eat away at the kelp forest mm. and they can be really voracious predators and there's you know millions and millions yeah. of um, urchins that come out of the depths and start eating the kelp um, so they can decimate whole kelp forests really quickly and and to some extent these shifts are sort of natural 
the urchin barren and the kelp forest are stable states that sort of alternate mm. in time. But there's been a really drastic change recently where 90% of the kelp forests along our coast are, are being decimated by urchins, um, and they're not really coming back very mm. quickly. And this is just a result of these ecosystem-wide changes that are mm. largely attributed to um, changing global ocean temperatures. Like right now, there's a, a hot anomaly in the ocean um, causing higher ocean temperatures, mm. And that has like a rippling effect that affects not only the urchins and the kelp, but also, you know, the charismatic megafauna, the, um, the gray whales are not able to find enough food. They have mm. to come in really close to shore. And then that leaves them really vulnerable to yeah. ship strikes with mm -hmm. humans. Um, mm -hmm. And um, we had an unusual mortality event called. So an unusually large number of uh, gray whales washed up yeah. on shore last year. Mm -hmm. um, and most of that was because they were coming in really close to shore because there wasn't enough food for them offshore. Mm -hmm. um, and then they were getting struck by ships yeah. or they were more likely to get eaten by killer whales. Mm. Either way, it's had a really drastic impact on them and then it that might happen again this year because of this hot yeah. water yeah it can be so devastating mm -hmm. just to like i mean how do you stay emotionally like you're just talking about is making me tear up if you guys can't mm -hmm. hear that like it, i sometimes i it's just so hard to hear when you hear these masses of beautiful animals washing up and knowing it's a lot of things that humans are doing mm -hmm. you know how can, how do you stay positive and encouraging when you see like you of all anyone sees firsthand how science and like actual data and the things that are happening how can you stay positive during that that these difficult shifts it's it's hard like yeah. i mean we talk about getting climate fatigue and i think yeah as scientists, it's not what I want to talk about all the time yeah. um, because it, it's exhausting to yeah. have to think about that all the time. But at the same time, I do think that these conversations are important. And also, we, we do have real policy changes that we can make mm -hmm. um, to, say, reduce the, the likelihood that whales will be hit by ships. Like right now, they're actually postponing the crabbing season in Bodega Bay so that the ships aren't going to go out and get crabs mm. and potentially run into whales that are pushed Migrating. further in or, yeah, um, coming and in because foraging of there. There's like a high density of whales right now. So by postponing their um, the opening of their season, they're, you know, probably getting really affected economically. Yeah. But that decision is able to keep the whales safe, at least for a little bit until hopefully they eat mm. enough and they move on. Mm -hmm. And then the crabbing season can open. But it's just going to require more flexibility, I think. Yeah. And and what our... Um, our responsibility is to react to the changes that we see and to observe them. Mm -hmm. So that's what scientists are out there doing. All we're asking is that people be flexible and, and react to the changes. Because some of the changes have direct impacts on humans, like demoic acid is the result of like hotter water and nutrient input causing algal blooms that can become harmful. And if the higher trophic levels eat too much of that um, toxic algae, it can build up in their systems. And then if it's eaten by animals like California sea lions, it can cause really serious neurological damage mm. and seizures Wow! and sometimes death. Mm. Um, and in humans, it could also have that same impact. But because we're able to observe like, oh, there's this many sea lions coming in sick with possible signs of this demoic acid toxicosis, we can stop the crabbing fishery mm. um, and we can stop the ingestion of humans eating this, um, yeah. not ingestion of humans, um, <laughs> <laughs> we can stop humans from ingesting this toxin mm -hmm. and, and prevent the humans from becoming sick. So some mm. of them can, some of these issues can have direct impacts on humans. Mm -hmm. Some are a little bit more more separated mm -hmm. but I think it's it's really just going to require us to to react and then act really quickly mm -hmm. um to try to minimize the impact on our on yeah. our ocean yeah and a lot of that just comes with reducing fossil fuel emissions because that's going to help mm -hmm. mitigate uh climate change mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I was going to ask you if you could give like a couple of tangible examples of things we can do, just simple things in our day to day of how we can impact climate change in a positive way. So, I mean, I think you, your listeners probably are familiar <laughs> yeah. with a lot of the, the you know, more typical examples, changing the way that you commute and, yeah. um, and making smart energy choices. And I think the thing that I would add to that is to make an effort to learn about your local eco- ocean ecosystem hmm. and what factors play into either its strength and resilience or its vulnerabilities and how you could talk to somebody um, in the community to to help support their efforts because I think a lot of people are thinking about these things and, mm-hmm. and, and different... Um, ecosystems in different states have very different issues like um, for example in Florida there's also the problem of harmful algal blooms but Mm. those are usually caused not by this large-scale oceanic anomaly they're instead caused by increased nutrient runoff um, from farmlands Mm. and I think learning about your ecosystem and your ocean Mm. I love that your local ocean yeah (laughs) um, and how how that works first, I think that's important to know. And mm-hmm. then, and then if you if you want to talk to someone about how you could help whatever they're doing, yeah. In it, some of it is just you can help a scientist record data um, to keep track of the changes, so that we can shut down fisheries the moment that we see um, toxic mm-hmm. uh, blooms um, and react more quickly and be more flexible to allow the mm-hmm. ocean to. You know, the ocean is resilient. It wants to heal itself. Yeah. Um, we just have to give it the opportunity to slow yeah. things down on our end enough yeah. for, for the ocean to mm-hmm. to show its strength. Yeah. Great tips, Jess. Thank you. Mm-hmm. What's your, like, go-to online resource? Like, if you're reading things about science and the ocean, do you have a publication or a website that you like to go to that, like, the general, any general person out there listening could go to? So it kind of depends if you're looking specifically for climate change information yeah. i think it's probably distilled more readily in in different publications by journals uh, sorry like uh newspaper sources mm-hmm. but uh, i often just use google scholar and look at scientific papers that way cool um it does require like a certain amount of scientific literacy which isn't a skill that all people have but it's certainly one that everybody can get you know it just you just need to practice learning and read the abstract take away the important parts and then find maybe a couple other spots in the article that that reinforce what's in the abstract Mm. make sense of those things so if if that works for you then I would go there but there's so many outlets right now trying to cover these issues yeah so where can people find you if they want to follow along on your social media or photography or illustrations and things you're doing Mm -hmm. so i have a website um jessiekb.com j-e-s-s-i-e-k-b um and my instagram is jessiekb underscore art okay um and i also have a facebook that's jessiekb art and photography cool and i'm trying to post more and more of my science as updates come up cool um yeah awesome uh and where can we find your book on your website yes um the book is on my website and you just uh put in jessikb.com slash looking dash for dash marla awesome congrats girl